Being a marketer is no sweat. You just have to manage dozens of channels, launch hundreds of campaigns, score thousands of leads, and... Okay, fine. It's a lot of sweat. Unless you have HubSpot's AI-powered marketing tools to help you do all that and more. Get started at HubSpot.com slash marketers. How old is Andre Drummond? Drummond was drafted in 2012. Yeah. That was 11 years ago, and he was 18 going on 19 at the time. I'm going to say not quite 30. Just turned 30. Oh, wow. Just turned okay. 30. How old is he in NBA years, though? <laughs> 42. <laughs> Easily. He's got to be at least 42. He came in as a 35 year old vet. Yep. With the hairy shoulders of a God bless him. 55 year old man. Yep. Don't be afraid of it, Dre. And now at the prime age of 30, he is already talking about the Hall of Fame. Perspective. Like I just said, I used to play 40 plus minutes. I was a star, all star, all NBA. I've done it. All of Fame candidate. Best rebounder ever. I've been seeing this little graphic going around. Something about you being the. Ever. Total rebound percentage? Ever. Oh, you already know what I'm talking about. I'm the best ever. No doubt. What do you mean? Okay, okay, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Big big man in, in the history of the game, where do you rank yourself? Where do you see yourself? In terms of rebounding? Or as a big man? All around, everything. Whatever you want. I'm not going to lie. There's some, some good-ass bigs in the time. I think I've done I've done great in my career. I think I have a chance to be a Hall of Fame player due to what I've done in my career. Actually, I'm pretty sure I'm in the top 20 for being in the Hall of Fame. So I have a great chance. Best rebound ever. Ever. He's the old stage in the locker room with Chicago. You know, like they needed a veteran presence. So they needed a 29 year old. It's the same thing with Steven Adams. Steven Adams, I feel like has been the old sage in the locker room. Dude, he's another one. Steven Adams grew long hair and a beard and aged, aged 10 years. <laughs> he's 30. Have you ever seen his rookie pick? Yeah, he's a baby. I'll never forget this. I went in 2011, his freshman year at Pittsburgh. I went to Pittsburgh to go watch some practice. And this is a team that had like Ashton Gibbs and Kim Birch and guys like that. Lamar Patterson, who had a cup of coffee in the league. And so I asked their guys like, yo, what's up with Steven Adams? This Adams kid that you guys have coming in. And they acted like, what? No, he's... He's not an NBA prospect. They're like, really? Because I kind of feel like he's on the radar. This kid's supposed to be huge or whatever. They're like, no, no. They're like, all right, whatever. And then, of course, the next year, he plays his freshman year, and he's an incredible. <laughs> Did you know at that point that he was from a New Zealand family that is, like, legendary? Yes. He's the youngest of 18 kids, and his older sister is a two-time gold medalist in the shot put. That's how he was on the radar. He's this big kid. Jamie Dixon had played in New Zealand or in the Australian league or whatever and played with his either older brother or with his dad, one of the two, I can't remember. Dude comes from like a crazy Olympic lineage and the whole family is like pro athletes of one sort or another. There's no way you're telling me like he's a four-year player. And sure enough, he wasn't a four-year player. Do you think if he had the hair and the beard at Pitt, do you think he'd be the number one overall pick? Because Anthony Bennett was the number one overall pick that year. Steven Adams went 12 that year. Do you think if he looks like he does now at Pitt, I think he goes number one overall. Well, yeah, because number one was so wide open. Like Anthony Bennett, people were like, who? So Oladipo is two, Otto Porter three, with Cody Zeller, I think was four. He definitely would have taken Cody Zeller's spot. If Giannis was jacked like he is now, <laughs> well, there, yeah. would he have gone number one? The ultimate what if. What if everyone looked what they look like right now? Cody Zeller would probably fall. Yeah. <laughs> he wouldn't get drafted. Mm -hmm. No, you know what? If Cody Zeller looked like he looked now. He'd be drafted by PwC yeah. as an accountant. He'd be drafted by the NBA to be assistant general manager or like a capologist to someone like that, man. Who looks older than I am. It's a testament to Andre Drummond's rebounding prowess that we started the segment talking about him and already are talking about Steven Adams' magnificent glow up. Speaking of Andre Drummond, he called himself the greatest rebounder of all time, which numerically, I guess you could say that. By what numeric? Total rebound percentage. Mm. That is the available missed shots that happen when a guy is on the floor. Estimated, yep. How many of them and what percentage does he collect? It's actually a great rebounding metric. Like, if you want to know if someone's a great rebounder, this is a way better metric than 10 rebounds per game or whatever. Having said that, if I could, I'd love to read some of the names who are in the top 15. Please. Number one is Andre Drummond at 24.9%. Basically, if four shots are missed, he's grabbing one of them. And I know that doesn't sound like much. That's insane. But for every four missed shots, he's grabbing one of them. That's actually an insane amount. Number two, 24.1, not that far behind. Hassan Whiteside. Oh. Number three, 
Dennis Rodman, 23.4%. Ah, okay. Hall of Famer Dennis Rodman. Number four, Boban Marjanovic. Oh, yeah. Future Hall of Famer. Number five, Clint Capella. Number six, Reggie Evans. Number seven, Rudy Gobert. May we? Number eight, DeAndre Jordan. Number nine, Dwight Howard. Number 10, Willie Hernan Gomez. Okay. All right. That's the line. Yeah. And you've stepped right over it. Yep. Now I'm sensing a common theme between all of those guys. I mean, with one exception, worming his way in there. Mm. All of those guys have played since the year 2000? Pretty much, yeah. Yes, every single player there has debuted in the 21st century other than Dennis Rodman. And the stat itself only starts at the year 1970. So seems to me like Andre Drummond has found a nice selective statistic that has cut out some of his biggest competition in history. Sure, sure. But for one moment, let's just assume by some accounting quirk that Russell and Chamberlain and everyone else who played in the pre-offensive rebound era, they all had middling rebound percentages. They're Willie Hernan Gomez, is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Look at this list. This is hardly a, well, right this way to Springfield, Mr. Drummond. Right, because if you're arguing that Andre Drummond should be in the Hall of Fame because he's the all-time leader in total rebound percentage, then Hassan Whiteside has a very strong case to follow him into the Hall because it's right there. He's 24.9 and Hassan Whiteside's 24.1. Better than Dennis Rodman. It's insane because if you look at Andre Drummond's overall biography, right? He played at UConn. They weren't good when he was there. They were all right. They were middling. Big Penguin. One-time All-NBA player. He's a two-time All-Star. He's never been on the all-defensive team. Well, they don't have an all-rebounding team, so. Yeah. Well, I guess, right? He's a four-time rebound champ, right? Okay. Then you take a look at Dennis Rodman, who is the one Hall of Famer at this point. We suspect Dwight Howard is going to be there at some point as well. But let's take Rodman and Howard as examples. Rodman specifically because people think of his rebounding as the main reason why. Dennis Rodman, two-time All-Star, just like Andre Drummond. Seven-time rebounding champ, two-time All-NBA, two-time Defensive Player of the Year, eight-time All-Defensive Team, NBA 75th Anniversary Team. Mm. I'm not even counting the championships. I'm just reading you his own personal accomplishment. It's not even close. And then when you expand it out and you say Dwight Howard, now you're really getting blown out the water. Eight-time All-Star, two-time block champ, five-times rebound champ, all-NBA team eight times, five-time all-defensive team, three-time defensive player of the year. Andre Drummond, in what universe are you a Hall of Famer? It's the facts. He was waived by his team when he was 27 years old and then has been a vet minimum guy ever since. A Hall of Famer? gets waived in his prime by the Cleveland Cavaliers. And yes, it was a cap move. But then ever since then, he was basically a veteran minimum player. I love Andre Drummond. I still don't think he's a Hall of Famer. Drummond has been the source of so many of my stories. His free throws. You guys share the hairy shoulder. Were hair bros. Okay. And I don't think he has anything to be ashamed of. All its glory. Don't wear a shirt. Don't worry about it. I learned that in college. It was okay. Now we can clearly see he is comfortable in his own skin and the hair that comes on top of it. I am a Hall of Famer because of my hairy arms and hairy back and my hairy shoulders and because I'm a great rebounder. But I also like this guy because I don't know if you knew this, I mean, Maze, but the illumination out there has to know that Andre Drummond is the greatest jump ball player of all time. Like the opening tip? What are you talking about? Yeah, like the opening tip, like the jump ball. Okay. I discovered this a few years ago. Andre Drummond has won 69.4% of jump balls. Nice. In his career. Okay. Is that higher than his free throw percentage? (laughs) It is. It is. Interestingly enough. Would you take a guess at what Yao Ming's jump ball percentage was? Oh, it has to be like 75%. I can't imagine him losing too many. 43. (gasps) Really? Whoa. Terrible rhythm, Yao. The thing about Andre Drummond, his ability to jump quickly. He's a crazy freakish athlete when it comes to jumping quickly. He can jump really fast, really high. And that's what helps him get those jump balls. And he just is a pogo stick all around the floor. However, I think there's two things we need to talk about with Andre Drummond. One is his rebound rate is great. But I mean, you were there in Phoenix, Robin Lopez starting for the Phoenix Suns. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask, is a good rebounder someone who gets the ball? Or is a good rebounder someone who makes sure his team gets the ball? Because what I've found is Andre Drummond, while he does collect 
the ball on a lot of his offensive rebounds. He doesn't box out very much defensively. And historically, his teams have been better off with him on the bench seven out of the 14 times defensive rebound rate. Dude, that's crazy. You know what that is? That's like guys that want to be defensive player of the year, but their teams defend better when they're off the court. NBA.com advanced stats. They don't have full seasons for certain players, but I found in the 14 stints in his career, because he had a lot of switching teams, he improved his team's offensive rebound rate in 12 out of the 14 stints when he was on the floor versus when he was on the bench. But when you look at defensive rebound rate, his team's ability to collect defensive rebounds only improved seven out of the 14 times. So it's basically a coin flip in his career. That's an interesting thing because basically offensive rebounding is very much an individual thing, right? The shot went up. Now it's kind of a free for all for the offensive players who are crashing boards versus the ones who are drifting back. We talk about defensive rebounding. That is more interconnected group think. This is what made Robin Lopez so great on the defensive glasses, even though his rebound numbers were anemic, I would say. Ultimately, teams rebounded better on the defensive end when he was on the floor because he took up so much space and he created those cavities that allowed other people to come grab rebounds, much like Steven Adams. Yes. And Robin Lopez loves boxing out. It's his favorite thing to do. Well, in 2022, well, in basketball. <laughs> no, his favorite thing to do is go to Disneyland. Disneyland. There you go. Yeah. Where he boxes people out to get to the teacups <laughs> first. To the churros. Media day with the Cavs 2022. You know how this works. I mean, the photographers get you in front of a big white screen and they take photos of like, you're holding a ball and you're snarling, whatever it is. And then... Sometimes the photography will be like, do your favorite thing in basketball, shooting a jumper, dribbling, do whatever. Robin Lopez's favorite thing was boxing out. So in the media day photo shoot, it's just him boxing out a ghost behind him. He has said on the record that it is a sexy thing, a sexy thing to be good at boxing out. It is. Is there anything sexier? No, I mean, look, you're putting your ass on someone, so that's pretty sexy. It's the basketball equivalent of chicks dig the long ball. Chicks dig the box out. Really quick here, guys, before we move on off of this, I have to point out Bill Walton and Moses Malone both checked in at 19 and 20 on the top rebounders. Just ahead of them at 18, Ennis Freedom. Oh, yeah. Oh, mm. makes sense. I think of those four guys together all the time. I just think Hassan Whiteside should be in the hall. Excusez moi, uh, uh, Monsieur Abertro and Monsieur Alassan. Alassan. Are you saying to me that, uh, that uh, the, Andre, the Andre Drummond he is a selfish rebounder and is no good with the, the rebounding assist come moi, Rudy Gobert? Wait, rebounding assist? What are you talking about? He is a, he is a selfish rebounder. He no box out. Is this a screen assist thing? He want all the rebound for himself. <laughs> you want credit for other people rebounding? Mais oui. Like you want credit for Donovan Mitchell scoring and Anthony Edwards scoring with your screen assist? But of course. Oh God. Gardez votre troisième oeil ouvert. My assignment. Uncover why the association inspires more conspiracy theories in volume and salience than any other U.S. sport. You've heard of the Illuminati. The truth is out there, but so are lies. Your eyes can deceive you. Don't trust them. The NBA has always been controlled by about eight people. Denial is the most predictable of all human responses. If you're only using 10% of your brain, you don't even know that you're using 10% of your brain. The NBA Illuminati. If coincidences are just coincidences, why do they feel so contrived? The Illuminati. But you start to follow the money. And you don't know where the f*** is going to take you. It is unspoken. They have influence among other players. The NBA Illuminati. I don't have time for your convenient ignorance. Maybe I'm a conspiracist now as well. That's but- all it took. Oh, we got books. We got schools. You saw a video on YouTube. <laughs> my, my eyes are... You've never used them before. We are the basketball Illuminati. <laughs> Thank you.
This is Basketball Illuminati. I am Tom Haverstro, and as always, I am joined by the five-star Illuminati Army Generals Amino Hassan and producer Anthony Mays, the co-presidents of the Illumination. We are here to talk about one of the biggest stories ever in the history of the NBA, an NBA referee retired. Tom's frozen and I threw a cat. Maze's cat is going nuts. I just threw a cat because she was being a bitch. <laughs> Am I still frozen? You're back now. An NBA referee retired. Nothing to see here. I decided to hang him up. Eric Lewis, 19 year official. You know, much like Andre Drummond ah. thinks he's a Hall of Famer already. Why not hang it up? Wait, while you're ahead. If you remember that name, it's because there was a burner account controversy in the NBA playoffs last year. And we brought on the referee whistleblower who found that burner account, the Twitter account that was clapping back at Lakers fans, etc. And guess what? We got him on a secure line to talk to the whistleblower himself. Mikey Weiland going to join us on the program. But first. You are listening to The Agenda with Tom Haverstro and Amin El Hassan. USA. Take that. USA. 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 Take that, you lousy Italians. Oh. Whoa. 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 Hey. Ah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. I got a vavanculo stronzo for you too, huh? Wow. <laughs> well, so much for that Noah Lyles curse, folks. Yeah. We were all ready to eat our words from last week's segment talking about the world champion sprinter who frowned upon the use of world champion by NBA players inciting the ire. I already forgot about him. What's his name? What does he do? Lyle's movie. Files. It doesn't matter what his name is. That's oh, right. Wow. This USA. With the rock. USA. We're number one. And by the way, Paolo Bancaro, he's saying this to team Italy. <laughs> For those who are listening to this, that sounded like you were clapping some cheeks there. <laughs> sounded a little weird. But Paolo Bancaro had a crazy good block. Off the backboard, pinned it. It was beautiful. A lot more where that came from. It seems like Team USA is back on track, right? That was a, a one game blip. This whole Lithuania is exposing their rebounding issues, and Noah Lyles' curse is real. And then they played Italy, and then boom, it's all gone. Nothing to see here. All a figment of whatever that guy's name is, imagination. So, Lithuania. Wow, Jonas Valanciunas and co. The greatest Lithuanian rebounder of all time. Yep. You know what? Let me see where he's at on my list here. <laughs> he's number 14 all time. Get him in the Hall of Fame. Come on. Right behind Omer Ashik and right ahead of Danny Fortson. Yep. Uh, Those three go together. This is a great list. I like how every player we bring up is sandwiched by some equally impressive rebounders. Oh, this is like Patino game heaven, this list right here. <laughs> Lithuania made its first nine three-pointers in that game against Team USA. So one third of a reverse Houston Rockets. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that a drill? Like a rocket going up? Yeah. A Lithuanian drill. Nine different players made at least one three-pointer. So nine straight three-pointers to begin the game. Nine players to make at least one three-pointer against Team USA in the big upset. It's a lot of nines in there. Nine. Nine. The opposite of nine in German. We don't talk about the number nine that much. Oh. We have. We did talk about it, didn't we? We did. We do 11 a lot. We do three. A couple weeks ago, Kyrie turned us on to the number 10. We talked about nine with regard to... Uh, uh, what's his name? I have no idea where it means going. Some kind of context clue. Are you frozen now? Oh, yeah. I think he's frozen. No, I'm not frozen. I just, ah! <laughs> <laughs> My brain is frozen. That's what's happening. That's awesome. That was a each ball reboot happening right there in real time. <laughs> nine. <laughs> Michael Jordan wore number nine. I mean. Yes, he did. Team USA. Yes, he did. You know why? Because nine is... One sixth of 45, which was his brother's number, which is why he wore 23, because he thought he was only half as good as his brother. Mm. And four plus five is nine. <sighs> yeah. And also six championships turned upside down is nine. And 23, if you take the three and then you. To the power. Yeah. Second exponent. Nine. And also the answer to is LeBron the greatest player of all time mm. in German is 
Nine. There you go. Scheisse. This is all a dream. Going back to 1992, the dream team. I watched this documentary the other day, and it just occurred to me. When Michael Jordan was number nine, on that 1992 dream team with Patrick Ewing, Charles Barkley, Larry, Magic, John Stockton, Carl Malone, there's an amazing little story that I don't know if people remember or even knew about, but that on their ramp up to go to Barcelona, this historic collection of all-time great players played the college team with Hurley, Chris Weber. Who else was on that team? Current Team USA managing director Grant Hill was on that team. And Chuck Daly was the coach. The bad boy Pistons, architect of the Jordan rules, created another rule for himself. June 24th, the dream team lost to the NCAA squad, 62 to 54. Five plus four? Nine. Daly did something that was genius. He benched Michael Jordan in the game and, as Wikipedia called it, made non-optimal substitutions. Hmm. And on that documentary that I saw on NBA TV, Coach Mike Krzyzewski, who was an assistant for Chuck Daly at the time, said that Chuck Daly threw it. Hmm. He threw the game. He fixed the game. Why? So they could get that hunger. They could realize that they were vulnerable, Hmm. that they could lose in Barcelona if they don't take things seriously. And they kept Michael on the bench. And I'm wondering, guys, who's the coach of Team USA right now? Steve Kerr. Did he ever play with Michael Jordan? Did they ever cross paths in their career? Uh, Maybe once or twice. Who did you say was on that team, that NCAA select team? Grant Hill. Grant Hill. Mm -hmm. And did Grant Hill ever like cross paths with Steve Kerr, like in the NBA? Sure. Steve Kerr was the general manager when Grant Hill signed with the Phoenix Suns. Interesting. Do you think Grant Hill told Steve Kerr, hey, this is a free game. If we lose this game, Lithuania, doesn't really matter. We're still going to be in the tournament. Do you think Steve Kerr threw the game? Steve Kerr throw the game? How would Steve Kerr throw the game? Well, we know that Jaron Jackson Jr., who's the starting center for the team, has a lot of foul trouble, foul issues. Yeah. And he was plus 16 in that Lithuania game, but he fouled out. Mm. They can't seem to get him to stop fouling. Plus 16 in the 15 minutes that he was on the floor. And I'm just thinking, you know, he's defensive player of the year. He knows how not to foul. But all of a sudden, he's fouling everybody. He's fouling himself out. And it occurred to me, is there a larger scheme at play here? Show me. Show me the reason. Tell me what's happening. If they're getting crushed on the boards and Jaron Jackson's fouling out and they refuse to play Walker Kessler out there, Uh it's a giant billboard saying we need help. Did you say giant? We need a big man. Oh. Are you processing what I'm processing right now? I'm trying to trust what you're processing. Why don't you walk me a little bit closer? That shining light. I'm going to nudge you right up to it. What is it? Open that third eye. I feel the warmth. Grant Hill is trying to recruit Joel Embiid to Team USA. And what better way to do that than to get bludgeoned on the boards, foul everybody out, and say, we need help. Look, Joel Embiid, come on down and see what kind of role you could fill. The hero's journey. I can just see it now. Joel Embiid with the American flag draped around his shoulders, walking out to the podium and winning that gold medal the next time out in Paris. Can you see it too? This is not where I thought you were going, Tom. I thought you were going to tell me that we were going to bring in the greatest rebounder of all time, Andre Drummond. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> to carry us on his Broad, furry shoulders. No, keep that flag off your shoulders. Let it breathe, baby. Maze, the Hall of Famer. Oh, man. We need Hall of Fame caliber help. Big Penguin saving the day, waddling his way over to save Team USA on the boards. I think it's very convenient that Steve Kerr, head coach of Team USA, used to play with Michael Jordan. Charles Barkley recently likened Steve Kerr to a one Chuck Daly for understanding his players and letting his players do their thing. Built the team to have no big men, no strong centers out there, no Bam out of bio, no Andre Drummond. And suddenly we're hearing about this. Joel Embiid is being recruited by Team USA. I posit to you that this is all one grand scheme to get Joel Embiid on the team. That's my theory. Grant scheme. Oh, look at that. This the hill you want to die on? It never occurred to me. <laughs> that this could be part of a bigger plan. It's a conspiracy. Tom, you're pretty plugged in there. It's almost like you're embedded with the team. 
You've been giving us updates daily. I'm going to chuck you off a McCall Bridge. <laughs> I think we need to cut off his mic. I'm trying to come up with a Krzyzewski <laughs> <laughs> joke. <laughs> I think Amin needs to be quiet. I think he needs to Krzyzewski out of here. He needs to shut up. Okay. Don't tell me how to coach, okay? Oh, man. We're going to duke this out right here? Oh, we keep going. I might holy take that one to the Bancaro. All right. I don't have the heart to go on anymore. We're just bobbying for apples at this point. Number nine. Are we done? I got to call my aunt, man. What the Halliburton are we doing here? Seriously. Well, mark my words. Very few of these will make the final cut. But that's how it's supposed to be, right? Mm, I feel like you're Ericking your grievances here. Eric Jordan. Wow, well, everybody's just thinking about the negative. Well, I think the, the glass is half full. Everybody thinks it's half empty. If you retire from the NBA as a ref, can you still ref international games? I think so. Yeah. I actually like watching these games because the referees are mic'd up and like the discussions with the coaches and the instant replay, you can hear them talking. And I think the NBA should add that. It'd be fun because then we get to see Billy Kennedy being a superstar, mm. an amazing mic'd up referee. We won't be seeing Eric Lewis, longtime NBA official. People might remember him from the Scott Foster video. Oh, yeah. Remember the Jack Harlow video where they're in the car and they're rapping? Walking through a hotel lobby, just smooth and very hip. Yeah, very hip officials. When they're in the car and they're rapping to a Harlow song, Scott Foster is on the steering wheel and to his right in the passenger side is Eric Lewis. He's retired. And if people forgot, Eric Lewis was the official on that Lakers game, the Lakers-Boston one, where there was that last second call that they missed. My doppelganger, Jason Goebel, missed the call. Eric Lewis was the crew chief for that game. And he said, we missed it. Whoopsies. And LeBron James went ballistic. Was that the Patrick Beverly camera game? It was. Oh, wow. Patrick Beverly handed the camera to a one Eric Lewis. That's the Eric Lewis we're talking about. What a beautiful photo that was. It was determined in late May that Eric Lewis had a burner account, a Twitter burner account that was sleuthed. Some Twitter user named Mikey Wylan discovered that Eric Lewis was behind this Twitter account and it went viral and then suddenly it went off the air, deleted and the NBA removed Eric Lewis from the finals roster after being there for four straight seasons we found out just last week that Eric Lewis is retiring abruptly, effective immediately. We are going to bring back Mikey Weiland to the program. We just have to ask him how he feels about all this. And you won't believe what happened recently. Coming up next, Mikey Weiland, the whistleblower. Hey, listener, guess what? You can spark something uncommon this holiday with just the right gift from our friends at Uncommon Goods. The busy holiday season is here. And Uncommon Goods makes it less stressful with incredible hand-picked gifts for everyone on your list. Yep, mom, dad, sister, brother, anybody. Weird uncle, doesn't matter. All in one spot. Gifts that spark joy, wonder, delight, and that, that's exactly what I wanted feeling. They scour the globe for original, handmade, absolutely remarkable things. Somehow, they know exactly the perfect gift for every single person you know. How crazy is that? Like a big jolly guy that just knows what to do. Here are a few of my favorite gifts that I found on their site. You know, I had to get me a California spoon rest. You can do like embroidered stuff. Going to do that for my parents or for their dogs. You know, some pet embroidered sweatshirts and t-shirts and stuff. And the piece de resistance for all of our fans who also love football. That football bingo set of two that we can all enjoy every Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Thursday, whenever they got football games for you. When you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses. Many of their handcrafted products are made in small batches. So shop now before they sell out this holiday season. And with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they give back $1 to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than $3 million to date. Let's get that number up by buying from Uncommon Goods. How do you do that, you ask? I'm so glad you posited that query. To get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash dings. That's uncommongoods.com slash dings, D-I-N-G-S, for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. Hey, listener, can you name every single subscription you have? There's that one. Sure. Uh-huh. You probably have that too. 
I think I have that one. Here's the thing. I know I can't name all of mine. I know because I just went through it not that long ago trying to figure out some tax stuff. Oh my goodness. I had two Hulu accounts at one point. I had two Paramount Plus accounts at one point. How does that even happen? We're not alone. Don't worry. I learned recently that over 74% of people have subscriptions they've forgotten about. With Rocket Money, I don't have to remember every subscription or worry about forgetting any because I can see them all laid out right in front of me. Most Americans think they spend about $62 per month on subscriptions. That real number is closer to $300. That's a massive difference. Almost five times what you thought you were spending. That's crazy. Even if just a couple of subs fall off your radar, those recurring payments, you don't even know. They can really add up. I had a Skype subscription. We haven't used Skype in a year, maybe more on Cinephobe. It's crazy. Managing finances can feel complicated and time-consuming, right? But it doesn't have to be. Rocket Money simplifies everything, making it so easy to see exactly what's happening with your finances, track your spending, and give you full control of it all right from your phone. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that helps find and cancel your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills so you can grow your savings. In this economy, it's got to happen. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions, saving members up to $740 a year when using all the app's premium features. That's a lot of money you could be saving. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash dings. That's rocketmoney.com slash dings, D-I-N-G-S, rocketmoney.com slash dings. You all think I'm licked. Well, I'm not licked. And I'm going to stay right here and fight for this lost cause. Even if this room gets filled with lies like these. And the tailors and all their armies come marching into this place. Somebody will listen to me. There's no better way to overpower a trickle of doubt than with a flood of naked truth. But the complexity and the gray lie not in the truth. But what you what do you with the truth you once you have it. What is true and right is true and right for all. You and I both know that that's just not the truth. You can't handle the truth! It's too messy. It keeps them up nice. I'm here because in the end, the truth is worth the risk. Truth Speak a little truth and people lose their minds. I'm a grown man. You can tell me the truth. Why is it people who want the truth never believe it when they hear it? So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do something really outrageous. I'm going to tell the truth. truth all right, we have a very special guest, uh, two-time truth teller, Mikey Weilen. And we had to bring you back, Mikey, because we have an update on the case. Mikey, it made the man retire, man. He <laughs> drove the man to retirement. Bro, it's crazy. He had to give up a job that he loved. That is so <laughs> strange. I actually have another update for you guys that you guys didn't know about. Oh, there's more. Another reason why yeah. I kind of caught on to that he might be in Virginia thing because his wife coaches at George Mason. And I had a really strong feeling that one day I might see him like in person. Like I had a really good feeling. I saw him in person. Where? So do you remember that clip people had put on that like he was directly roughing? Did you see that at all? Yeah. So it's just a wild set of like crazy coincidence. I have a friend who really runs that league. And I had friends who were there. It was the championship night. And they're texting me. They're like, yo, you're not going to believe this. He's here reffing. And I was like, nah, there's no way. Like, they sent me a picture. It was like from behind. And it kind of looked like him. But I was like, nah, man, there's no way. Like, I have to go see, like, if this is true. Because I want to, like, humanize him. I walked in and it was, yeah, it was him. We were probably, like, four feet from each other. He looked right at me. He said, what's up? But I don't think he knew it was me. I was walking in with the host. He was like, what's up? I was like, yo, what's up? And I was like, well, this is crazy. <laughs> I sat down, I'm watching the game. People around me were all whispering, like, that's that ref. And I was like, oh, really? Yeah. Acting like I was clueless. <laughs> <laughs> what ref? Yeah, I was like, oh, really? Oh, wow, that's that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> but at this point, you don't know where the investigation has gone or concluded. You're just seeing an NBA finals referee. You didn't know you were looking at a dead man the entire dead time. Dead man. Dead man walking. That's a wild ending. Three months of investigation, then he retires. So did you have a moment where you wanted to, like, introduce yourself? I did. I definitely did. After the game, he was kind of with his family. I think his family was there. 
And it was like the championship, so there was like a lot of people. So I didn't really want to make it like a big scene out of it. Right. I was gonna be like, hey man, like that was me. I wasn't really trying to like make something of it. You know, I was just trying to introduce myself in a, in a way, but it wasn't the right time. So I was like, I'm not gonna bother. Mikey was like, he's fine. He'll yeah. be back reffing next year, no problem. It's right. water under the bridge. He really likes reffing, you know. He knows reffing. This is this thing. <laughs> Do you feel differently now than when we last had you on the program? Because you came on right after the burner was discovered. Yeah. There was an investigation open. He was pulled from the NBA finals. Eric Lewis, who had been refing the last four NBA finals, and then they removed him from the roster. And at that point, you were just like, yeah, man, I just kind of stumbled upon this thing because this guy was in my mentions all the time, did some sleuthing and figured out from his Instagram account, his email address, and it matched up. And now we find out that the NBA did not conclude the investigation before he handed in his paper. So a two sentence press release from the NBA announcing that Eric Lewis had informed the league that he was retiring. And the NBA said, hereby this place is closed. Mm -hmm. Bang the gap. Mm -hmm. Your reaction was what? Surprised. Eyebrows raised. Like I had more questions now. Huh? (laughs) Did they find something? Was there a conversation before that? Or was it just like a, you know what? My hands are up. You got me. I'm the head of officiating over here. There was the MEAC. He's got another job somewhere. Maybe he was just like, done with this. I don't want no more attention to it. Just more questions. I want to ask this to everybody because I've heard two different reactions. One reaction was he retired because he just didn't want to get deeper into whatever he had going on. The other reaction is he did retire. The league kind of squeezed him. Hey, man, you need to you need to go ahead and bow out over here yeah. because this is embarrassing. So which do y'all think it is? I don't know. That's the thing. Because from tweets alone, that didn't look fireable. Right. Even though they brought up the point that it you can't comment on officiating publicly like that, it didn't seem like something you would fire like one of your most veteran refs for. Two things I'll point out here, Mikey and Amin, Maze. Did you see what the referee union tweeted out? No. Nah, what did they say? Nothing. Oh. Wow. <laughs> well, damn. Well, I did see that. I saw nothing. Did you see the NBA <laughs> wishing him well and like, thank you for your 19 years? Yeah. No, you didn't. Wow. That's a great point. That's why I lean towards the latter. I mean, that's why I think it's the second one. This is a, instead of firing you and calling more attention to the fact that there's an investigation and whatever we did turn up, I think they said, you know what? If you retire, We'll just make all this stop right now. We just let it slide. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the last three months have just been like a ongoing negotiations of how we're going to let this thing, you know, end. You mentioned the MEAC. So the MEAC, it's the conference that I think Coppin State is in there. Yeah. It's an HBCU conference that is D1. Florida A&M. You know, we used to call it, Tom, when we were scouting. <laughs> this is <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> We, oh, no. we call it the Chitlin Circuit. <laughs> yeah, hey, yeah, I've heard that though. I've, I've heard, I've actually heard that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you got to go like, hey man, what, what you got this week? Oh man, I got to do the Chitlin Circuit. They got me watching. Yeah, Bad Mew versus Common State. <laughs> Out there. <laughs> I didn't know what Chitlins was until I got to the South. Oh man, to college down in Winston Salem. Yeah, man, I was surprised on the news because I had been hearing on my end that he was facing a multi-year suspension for real. There was rumors going around that Eric Lewis was having a big suspension dropped on him. So I was checking in with the league about this seeing like, Hey, what's the update? And then boom, press release hits. That's it. Oh, he's gone. See that. Normally when referees retire, Even when they're in some sort of controversy, there was a few years back, one of the referees was arrested and had a DUI. And like a month later after that, they announced that he was retiring. Mm -hmm. And even in that, they said, we wish him well. Thank you for the 32 years or whatever it was as an NBA referee. Best of luck. Nothing like that on Eric Lewis. It was a two sentence press release, which made people around the league I'm not talking about the league office here, but teams, executives, coaches, what have you, scratch their chin and be like, what's that about? Because these lawyers and the PR folks at the league, they work on these statements. They go back and forth for weeks, maybe months on what they're going to say publicly. So it's not any accident 
that it was a two sentence press release. There's a reason for that. I don't know what that reason is officially, but I can tell you that Mike, your reaction of like, what did they find? What else was there is not just a public sentiment. It's internal teams are like, what else was there? What else did they find? It seems like a very hastily closed investigation. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm wondering, is it odd to you that they closed an investigation once he leaves? No. Is there any reason for you to keep that investigation open, even if the person is no longer with your company? Well, before you say that, let me ask, you said you heard two years suspension. Did people tell you why they thought it was a crazy suspension? Because like Mikey said, what he tweeted, even though it's clearly him, it doesn't feel like something that's that egregious or bad or even detrimental to the integrity or anything like that. Oh. So here's what I think is interesting too, to that point. Do you think the content of his tweets on his burner account was what caused the lengthy suspension or the retirement, what have you, for him to leave? Or was it that he blamed his brother for it? Because that's an interesting detail to this story is that when this burner account came about, Mikey, yeah. he deleted it, came back on and then said, hey, everybody, it's my brother, Mark. I'm Eric's brother. <laughs> yeah. And then as far as I could tell, Mikey, the account is deleted again. Yeah, I think it's gone. Yeah. It existed. It deleted, reappeared, say, hey, nothing to see here. This is the brother. This isn't Eric. I'm Cliff Paul. <laughs> yeah. And then deactivated again. So does that play into it? Is the idea of like, is the cover up worse than the crime? Instead of being like, hey, man, it's Eric Lewis. My bad. It's more of, uh, it was my brother. Uh, that's the thing. I don't know. Like, I guess it depends on those first conversations he was having once the league called him like, hey, man, like what's going on? Oh, like he lied to the league, like the league asked him. Maybe they reached out. and But it has to be something more than just the tweets, which I don't know, man. Quick question. Have we heard from Brian Colangelo? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do we know what he's doing right now? Yeah, hacking in that account. <laughs> is he on the island that Eric Lewis is being sent to yeah. right now? Is that what's happening here? Thing. Is this way more serious to the NBA than we think it is? Do you think there's a crisis coach that Brian Colangelo and Eric Lewis both consulted while their burner was identified? <laughs> it's Ray Donovan. It's the NBA's version of <laughs> Leah Schreiber's character. Yeah. The fixer. The more I think about it, they must have found something else. Something feels weird. Maybe it was a different burner that was dealing with a little bit more than just defending him. I don't know. This can't be the thing where they, A, either considered suspending him for two years or B, pushing him out to retire. It has to be something like, yeah, this gets a lot thicker. Like, yeah, it's embarrassing, but it ain't. Even you, Mikey, your reaction at the time was like, that's odd. It wasn't like, this guy's wild. And it was just like, <laughs> that's a weird thing for a random Twitter user to be like sticking up for. Yeah. Tom, you know, this information that you brought upon us makes it even more confusing. What, that he was facing potentially a multi-year suspension? Yeah, the fact that it rose to that level. Well, I don't know that that's true. Let me just say, I don't know if that was true. That is what was going through the grapevine. Mm. People were saying around the league, is like, oh, I heard this, I heard that. And then all of a sudden, boom, he's retiring. So if I was looking at a two year suspension, I would retire. I think that's a better out. Is it unpaid suspension? Like all those variables matter. Can you work at the college level? Yeah. Can you work elsewhere? Or are you basically sitting there on the bench, not getting paid? And then you have to work your way back into being an NBA finals referee. Right. So there's that. We also should know he's 52 years old. And that might seem on the older end of the spectrum, but that's actually roughly average for an NBA Finals referee. Scott Foster's 56. Tony Brothers is 58. Yeah. Mark Davis is 55. Zach Zarb is 48. Like all of the NBA Finals referees are around the same age as Eric Lewis. So the idea of him retiring, I think he's something like the 20th oldest referee in the referee roster. So it's not necessarily consistent with the normal quote unquote retirement age yeah. for an NBA referee. That's why this raises the antennas around the league. We've all seen Dick Bavetta. <laughs> we know yeah. that he's not close to retirement age. It was just weird. Mike, do you feel more motivated to do sleuthing on referees now? Or do you feel like the block <laughs> got too hot on this one? I'm, I'm good. Now, I don't know. Because at first it was fun. It was funny at the end of the day. You know, it was just something 
the last with during the NBA playoffs. Now it's like, huh, what's going on here? Devastated a man's life, man. Yeah. Like, that's got to be a wild feeling. Like, this is funny. This Twitter kind of thing is funny. And then all of a sudden, the dude is like, you know what? My career is over. He's like, shit, I didn't want to do all that, man. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. What's going on here? Honestly, I thought that it was just going to be one of those things where he just pop back up regular season. He's out there reffing. Yeah, sweep it under the rug. Yeah, we all forgot about it. We didn't really care anymore. That was it. You know, move on. That was the thing. I don't think anybody really cared anymore. It was just whatever. I forgot, to be honest with you. Yeah. I completely forgot they had an investigation going until the announcement. I don't think anybody would have had a problem with him out there wrestling anymore. Like, that wasn't like a thought. Not to me, at least. Maze, did you want to do a little code breakers here on the statement? It says, NBA referee Eric Lewis has informed the league office that he is retiring. That in of itself is interesting. They're claiming Eric Lewis came to them and said, I'm hanging it up. I'm done effective immediately yeah so it's not like i'm retiring at the end of the season this is my last year right now effective immediately this is it the second sentence in light of this decision the nba's investigation into social media activity has been closed well now that he's retired why would we waste the man hours yeah doing some research and investigation yeah the whole statement the structure of it is not true. <laughs> I'm going to go out on a limb and say that that is not the order of events. That is not how it went down. Not at all. And so that's why I think that out of the two scenarios that Amin proposed, it is the latter. They found something. They were looking at him. They said, well, we could either suspend you, put this out there. Clearly, no one knows what it is. Or you could retire and we could just sweep it away. That's what happened. So they offered him that. He didn't decide that on his own. He didn't inform them of that. They informed him that that was an option that he could have. Well, that happens in every workplace in America. If you leave somewhere, they offer either a severance package and then an NDA. That happens all the time in corporate America. So the idea of them like offering a deal to retire, that isn't totally outlandish. And he hasn't put out a statement that I can tell as of this recording. The union has not put out a statement. And the only statement that's come out is from the league. And it's two sentences. There's not even a bio of like, he refereed this many playoff games and finals games and all this stuff. It is just facts. It's the, the facts. T- so the MEAC, right? Like he took a supervisor position with the MEAC a day before you found that account. That is so crazy. It was May, I think May 24th. Yep. He's announced as he's going to be running the officials for a college basketball conference. And then your discovery happens the day after. Mm-hmm. And it's all happening during the playoffs. Right. Smack in the middle. Biggest week of his season is he's going to be elevated into uh, NBA finals referee, which you get a bonus for every next round of the playoffs that you make as a referee. If you get named to the second round, you get a bonus, the third round. And then the finals, you get a bonus. So Mikey, this is crazy. I didn't expect this like you. I did not expect that would be it for him. I guess you might see him later again this summer in the fall. <laughs> I don't know. I might. That's going to be ridiculous. You see him again, you go going to say, hey, man, my bad. I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like the episode of Fresh Prince where Carlton and Will got caught in old girl apartment and the dude came home from prison. <laughs> yeah. Will said, hey, man, there's only one way out. We got to fight. And he punched the dude and the dude just stared at him. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, My bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's Mikey Wylan, who runs the Twitter account at Mikey, M I K E Y underscore Wylan, W Y L L I N. Want to know against the <laughs> referees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just waiting for like a SUV, all black, of just like referees to hop out on me, man. Like that. <laughs> Luckily, you're here. The whistle's coming before they get right. there. So. I'm just going to hear a whistle at night. <laughs> Ed Malloy and my man, Bill Kennedy, going to hop out, grab him, put a bag over his head. Right. <laughs> you tough, huh? Yeah, you, you tough, huh? There's no coincidences, man. Man. Mikey seeing him this summer, that is wild. Yeah, that's crazy. Damn. Smallest world shit ever, dude. Of all the places. No mistakes, no coincidences in this world. Now you're starting to keep your third eye open, Mikey, where you're like, wait, was I chosen to find him? Yeah, and now I'm like, uh-oh. Out of all people, I just like the idea that everybody around knew what was happening. Yeah. And they're like, hey, man, there go that dude. I'm just like, oh, really? Because <laughs> I'm now in paranoid. I'm thinking like, 
Does he know these people? Is it like a setup? He trying to get me out of here? It's only a matter of time it's up a set. Hey, man. Hey, Mike. Y'all want to be some? All right. Every ref in the NBA is in that room waiting on me. <laughs> that door closed. Yeah. You hear that click? Uh-oh. <laughs> Guys, I know everyone's getting caught up with Canada and USA and then the USA losing and all this shit. But like the real big news, obviously, from this is that South Sudan qualified for the Olympics. And that's a big deal because this is the youngest country in the world. They gained their independence in 2011 after a referendum, splitting the Sudan into two. But more importantly, this is a program that might be the greatest Cinderella story in basketball ever, considering how underfunded and underdeveloped the program was when Luol Deng took it over three years ago. And for them to be qualifying for the World Cup and then qualifying the Olympics, just remarkable stuff. Yeah, the leader of the team, Luol Deng. Yep, and the head coach, Royal Ivy, former NBA player and NBA coach. But, you know, this is one of those things where basically most of the players on these teams are either refugees or the sons of refugees. Many of them are either from here in the United States or Australia is another hotbed. And Luol has been doing these camps for years. Mm -hmm. For years, he's been having these camps every summer in places like Omaha, Nebraska, and Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and places where there's a large Sudanese refugee community. Introducing the game to many of them and developing the game. And man, how cool is it that he's been able to turn this around, this program around within three years and by the way, a lot of his own money has gone into this endeavor. So the Royal Ivy connection is that Royal Ivy mentored Luol Dang at what high school back in New Jersey? They went to Blair Academy. Royal's from Jamaica. Like he used to play, my cousins used to play pickup ball against him at Cunningham Park in Jamaica, Queens. But he went to Blair Academy, which is a prep school that Luol went to when he came here from England. Mm. And that's how they got to know each other, I guess. I don't know if they went to school at the same time or Royal was a little older than him, but was an alum of the school. Brian Winhurst has the story on ESPN.com. Royal Ivy was quoted, he said, a year ago, we were practicing outside with eagles flying around <laughs> while we were practicing and the courts were flooded. To go from there to come and play in front of these fans in the Philippines, you know what he said right after that? It's like a dream come true. What did he say? He's on cloud. Nine? 